Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel, Beers Book Reviews, and today I'll be reviewing this book, The Republic by Plato. There it is right here. And before I start this review, I just want to say that this book is, instead of being segregated by chapters, it's segregated by books. So what happened was Plato who is the author of this book, actually wrote several books back in the day. Um, there are nine or ten of them. I, I, I forget the exact figure, but he wrote nine or ten books, and this one is an amalgamation of all of those and all the contents of those books. Um, I don't know if this print is entirely historically accurate, because that is a very difficult thing to pin down. You know, obviously, historic texts get changed over the over the years according to whoever is the ruler at that time that has historically happened you know someone might not like a particular part of some text who was the ruler at that time and he might say he wants to delete it and that happens so historical accuracy i'm not too sure of but it is an amazing book let's let's get started with the review so this book is a dialogue between a bunch of interlocutors and the main protagonist of the book, so to say, who is Socrates. Now, Socrates and Plato, you might have heard of them. They're very famous Greek philosophers. You know, they lived back in the day and they're renowned for a lot of ideologies and uh, thinking points that they put forward during their time. And this book does quite a lot of that as well. So it's a discussion that Socrates is having with various interlocutors throughout the book um, about building the ideal state so to say, you know, what would an ideal state look like? And they talk about all the various aspects of an ideal state, such as what should the ideal man of the state be like? What should the ideal woman of the state be like? What should their professions be? What type of justice would we administer? What type of governance do we, do we employ? The book talks about all of that and uh, a, lot, a lot more. It's, uh, I don't want to make this review too long. I don't want to dwell too deep into all of the arguments. Firstly, because there's a lot of them. And secondly, because I don't think I would be able to do uh, do Socrates or Plato any justice by condensing them in a very, uh, very short form and present them. I think if you really need to get the true understanding of, of the contents of the book, you need to read it yourself. And so talking very um, generally about the book, it starts off with a discussion of justice and what is justice. And that's within the first book, book one. And that is when you truly grasp the, or, or try to start to get an understanding of what what is to follow. Because within the first 50 pages, the book bewilders you with arguments about justice and uh, Socrates refuting those arguments and putting forth his own arguments. And then someone, you know, one of the interlocutors coming along giving his point of view and uh, presenting opposing views to that argument. And, uh, you know, within the first 50 pages, there's this sort of big argument about what really is justice. And um, one of the pages which really got me in, uh, enticed into the book, which really got me hooked on it, was um, this discussion that, okay, well, you know, one, per one person says that justice in reality is the reign of the will of the powerful over the will of the weak in in the state and so socrates says that well okay both the weak and the powerful individual within the states is human right and yes that is true so humans are always bound to error and that is also true you know sooner or later there must be some error on the part of either the strong or the or the weak individual in the state and since the strong individual a strong, so to say, individual of the state is in charge of administering justice, you know, there will be a point when he he makes a lapse in judgment while administering the, the, the justice. And yes, that is also true. And so would that not mean that the strong individual of the state goes against his own will? And to go against the will of the strong is to, is to go with the will of the weak. And so he does not really administer justice, does he? 
that was one of the first arguments in the book and it really it really captured uh, you know my interest because this style of writing this form of debate this form of argument over over such topics as justice you know what really is justice you, even today we have a lot of trouble defining justice in the contemporary world and so to see people from 2500 years ago arguing about the same in a very different style from today is really really interesting and so there's this discussion about justice and they move on to all the other realms of building an ideal state and the notion of the ideal state really is something quite complicated you cannot really compare it to what today we would call an ideal state because um this book is very uh, it's said uh, in post peloponnesian war athens when athens lost the peloponnesian wars to sparta so it was not really a very stable time period and you know these types of discussions were they would they they came with a very heavy historical context you know this pretext of the peloponnesian war and so the thinking and the and the uh, what some people in the state would consider ideal does change after you lost a major war so that is the historic context that you need to take it with and i think that would come especially in handy when this book gets controversial around book 7 8 and 9 when uh, socrates talks about the ideal government form um of the state that they're building so you know which type of govern government system should we have and today in the modern world we say that the ancient greeks gave us the greatest form of government which is democracy and every almost every single country today runs on democracy and if any country does not it it's it's ousted from the global political arena uh, you know it's not really seen as uh, a good quote unquote good state it's seen as oppressive it's seen as backwards but in the book socrates actually makes the argument that democracy is the second worst form of government you can have right above a tyrannical authoritarian regime and so you know socrates makes this very well put well constructed argument of how the ideal state should be an aristocracy you know based on merit people get positions of power and influence solely based on their capabilities to execute the, uh, certain tasks and you know he he chronicles the journey of the ideal state which is democracy and the ideal man of the uh, sorry the ideal state uh, which is an aristocracy and the ideal man within the state and how eventually over a period of period of time they fall from grace going from a from an aristocracy to a democracy to surprisingly an oligarchy and then democracy and then uh, authoritarian tyranny uh, tyranny he chronicles this journey and he gives very well put arguments as to why he believes that you know the, the best form to govern a people is through aristocracy now obviously today uh, an aristocracy is not too well received by uh, anyone be it on the left side of the political divide or the right side of the political divide it is sort of uh, there's a global consensus that you need to have democracy and so to see this uh, very well constructed argument against democracy from a long time ago uh, by the supposed forefathers of democracy is is really interesting and that happens throughout the book it really gives you a lot of new uh, not even ways of thinking but new dimensions of thinking um another really surprising thing about this is that uh there's a lot of feminism sprinkled in the book and feminism not in the in the contemporary sense that it's been distorted into you know when we say feminism today most people think uh, of this of this uh, oppression of men's rights to favor women's rights that's not really what historically feminism has meant feminism you know more in the original sense of the term means that men that women are given equal rights as men in every single domain and so this book talks a lot about that you know when they talk about educating the children and the populace of the state socrates mentions that you know this does not just apply to men you know this also applies to women they they are also free to endeavor into any craft that they want they can learn any art that they want they can go into the sciences uh, or they can even partake in the military which is surprising you know because even today we don't 
a lot of countries around the world don't give that freedom to women, you know, to serve in the military or to say go into a profession of their choosing. There's a lot of things in here, which when you read them, you think, well, uh, you know, today we're supposedly living in the best times of human existence. We're at the peak of human uh, human life, so, uh, so to say. But this this person from 2,500 years ago is telling us that in an ideal state, women should be equal to men. And a lot of countries nowadays don't follow that. So it makes you think that have we in some ways digressed backwards or in the wrong direction of what we we intended to to be. <clears throat> Um, there's that argument. You know, there's the argument about religion. Should the general populace of a state be religious or not? What what religion should they follow? And again, there's a lot of fre- flexibility that, that, that Socrates provides in his arguments is that they should have a religion. The And especially the warriors and so-called guardians of the state. They need to have a religion, but is that religion the same as we follow? Is, is that a different one? That's not really well well defined in the book. It's up to debate. You know, he leaves that part open. So there's a lot of things like this. And um, one quote which really stuck with me, I'll just read it to you here. It is on page number 200 and, let's see, what was it? (coughs) 291, yes. It's in book seven. Uh, it, It reads, Because a free man ought not to be a slave in the acquisition of knowledge of any kind. Knowledge which is acquired under compulsion obtains no hold on the mind. That's not really something we see nowadays. Nowadays, the form of education that the, uh, the children or even the adults in, the, in most countries are subject to is more or less forced upon them. People are forced to go to school, they're forced to pick subjects and stuff like that. But again, 2,500 years ago, this person was saying a lot of intelligent things. And, you know, a lot of platonic ideals that we talk about even today, which are in discussion, uh, you know, such as Plato's cave or the allegory of the cave that is mentioned in this book, I believe, for the first time. Uh, You know, an overview of the allegory of the cave is basically some people are trapped within a cave and external forces are casting shadows on the walls of the cave and over a long enough period of time the people living in the caves actually tend to believe that these shadows are reality and that this is everything that that there is to learn and know about so that that concept might be pretty analogous someone would figure to uh, this discussion of the so-called matrix that we hear today online and a lot of people talk about it and especially in the um, you know, U.S. politics in recent times, there's this, uh, there's this big talk of bureaucracy and the deep state and stuff like that. That might be analogous to Plato's cave and uh, and the allegory of the cave. So again, these these things that are still in contention today, you know, they're still talked about, they're still debated. They were first mentioned by Plato in this book 2,500 years ago from now. And I don't do th- I don't do this ever. But if I were to put uh, this, put, summarize it in one word, I would say, wow. Because that is the reaction that I've had time and time again, reading reading these pages, reading these arguments, you know, both sides of the, uh, reading both sides of the argument, you know, for democracy against democracy, for aristocracy against aristocracy. And all of those things, when they're um, amalgamated into this one book, it's, the word that comes out of my mouth is wow and it did take me a lot of time to get through the book uh, particularly because i mentioned it's it's very complicated reading you know it's not really simple uh, it's not really put in simple terms um i don't know how to exactly put it but if you've ever read like old time uh, literature you know sort of like shakespeare it's along those lines in in in, the, in in terms of how it's written and the writing style. And um, I also watched uh, uh, three lectures by a Yale professor, Michael Michael Segru. I I believe I'm saying that right. And he also says this in his first lecture about the book uh, that you know you haven't really read the Republic until you read it five or six times. 
so yeah it is a very complicated book it is very heavy handed there's a lot of things that it talks about you know it's it's gonna be pretty controversial sometimes it's gonna be pretty progressive sometimes but as i said it it comes with a very hist- a very big historical pretext and you need to keep that in mind while you read this book and i believe that anyone can read get into this book it doesn't matter what your political ideology is doesn't matter what your economic ideology is it doesn't matter what your religious ideology is it none of those matters things matter when you go into this book because there is going to be at least something at least one thing within this book that that's going to make you say wow i never thought of it like that so yeah this is the book once again and it might not be it might be too early to say this for me but this is the best book of, th- of this year hands down for me at least so this is it right here once again hope you guys enjoyed the review if you did make sure you hit the like button if you're new and haven't already done so subscribe to the channel to keep receiving more videos like this one i've been a rao and thanks for watching